We're going to start out this series with a quilt which we call Lover's Knot. And when you look at this quilt, you'll see that there is a dark and a light knot. When first selecting the fabrics for this quilt, you need to select a fabric with a lot of life and sparkle. And then from that fabric, select five more to go with it. Make sure that the fabrics you select have a different amount of background and texture in them. They can't all be the beautiful fabric in the quilt. Just remember that first choose the brightest and the most exciting one. Then also make sure that you choose uh, two fabrics that are in great contrast to make the light and the dark knot happen. Because that really is what makes the design in this quilt. Now we all know that it takes two to tie the knot at the altar and that's why this quilt is called Lover's Knot. Before we go to the next quilt, I also want to show you the quilting in this uh, quilt and how it adds to the knot itself. We have stitched a fourth of an inch from the edge of each of the pieces in this design, but it's done a little differently. We have ignored the seam line in the center and we have crossed over that area to actually look like the knot is really tied. And then the other pieces to fill out that block are quilted also by color instead of by piece and we have ignored the seam line so there actually is an L in each of those pieces. The outside edge of this quilt has of course the one that has all the sparkle and you can't see the quilting in it but to add dimension the lighter leaves have been, have been hand quilted around them. Now you don't have to make a queen size quilt like we did for this show. You can make a table runner, a placemat, a wall quilt, probably even a baby quilt. And also keep in mind that you can do it for any decorating theme that you want. Make a baby quilt, use pinks and blues, uh, whatever you might want to do. Now before we start cutting the lover's knot, I want you to look at a quilt that we made in the 400 series. This quilt is similar to the lover's knot because the blocks were off center, which simply means that you start building the block from the corner. The big difference between this one and the lover's knot is that you'll see a square running through the design which has a very strong color in it. Actually, you see a cross hatching uh, made by those little squares. So you see there is a lot of similarities, but just with a little bit of change of color, placement of color and shape, you get a whole new look. In fact, you could spend a quilter's lifetime with the log cabin pattern because there are so many things to do. And it's wonderful for uh, the beginner because it's all straight sewing and the advanced quilter likes it just as much because you can experiment with color as well as design. Before I start cutting, I want, you to, show, want to show you the two blocks in front of me. Now to make the knot happen in this quilt, you just have to make two different blocks the one with the light on the outside and then one with the dark one. And you have opposite the light, the dark up here in the corner and on, on the one that's dark you have the light up here. Now look at what happens when I flip this around. Now this is how you get the light knot when I flip them around like that. And if I do like this, just turn them around like this, then we have the darkest knot. So you see it is a very simple one for a beginner to do. Now when it's time to start cutting, of course you have to get all your fabric ready and you've already selected all of it and you need to take the time to prepare it. Make sure you wash everything and then dry it in an automatic dryer. But wash it with a soap that doesn't have any bleaching additives in it. Then you need to start cutting for each of the shapes. And these are the pattern shapes up in front of me. 
Actually, I'm going to show you how they fit into the design. And that also makes it easier for you. The A is used a couple of times in the center. Then the B is used for the next two colors like this. And the same thing happens with each one of them. So what I'm trying to say when I explain this, that you don't use this piece for both of these. You just use this one once. You just keep graduating um, up in size. I won't cut all of the pieces. I'm just going to show you how to do one of them. And the one that we're going to do is the one with a lot of sparkle. And we'll use uh, template E. And the rest of them will be done all the same. Now this time, I'm going to cut it a little different than I normally do. I have folded the fabric in half, and I have matched up the selvage edges out here. And then I'm going to fold it one more time like this. So now I have matched the folded edge with the selvage edge. And I'm going to use a square ruler this time instead of the long one, which I use um, more of the time, actually. And then I'm going to use a rotary color cutter, and we will straighten this edge. Now, when you're using your rotary cutter, or not using it, actually, put it away in a case so that you don't have um, to worry about it getting dull. Now, the first cut I'm going to make, I'm going to go backwards and then continue on like that. And then fold the fabric up on top and let it travel on top of the board. Okay, now I was telling you that we're going to do template E and we'll make sure that's right. It's the one that goes in here. And I need to cut strips that are six and three-fourths inches long. So we'll move the ruler over here to the six and three-fourths inch line. And we'll lay it down here. OK, now I'm going to turn the mat again. And I'm going to cut the pieces like this instead of what you would expect to do going this way. And the reason I do that is so that I don't waste fabric. So we'll make this cut first. And then I have to, of course, turn it so it's easy to get at my work. Now I bumped the template, so I got to move it over. OK, and then we'll go. Just keep working across that strip. You'll notice that I have put uh, fabric grips on the back side of the templates, and that will help me uh, keep accuracy as I'm cutting. See how easy that is to do? You could actually, if you were using the large rotary cutter, cut for two colors in your block at one time. But if you're just getting started, maybe you would want to just do uh, one, one set of strips at a time. That's how easy it is to cut all of the pieces, just for each of the different colors. And then after you're done cutting all the pieces, of course, you arrange them on a flannel board until you like that arrangement. But until I use all of them, I keep them in an envelope, and I can easily see all of the colors in there, and I just take out the pieces that I need as I'm working. One thing that I like to do uh, when I'm working on any design is put it, of course, on a flannel board. And that is so nice because you can stand back and look at it and decide if it's really a, a quilt that you want to continue with. Now this, of course, is one complete block. I'm going to show you the back side of the flannel board. It's simply just a Q-snap frame holding it up as an easel. So that gives another use uh, for your frame. Well, now we're all ready to start putting the quilt together. 
I'll be sewing all the seams with cotton thread to match the fabric for content as well as strength. Then I will also set my machine for a scant quarter inch seam allowance and I will have it on 2.5 for the stitch length, 3.0 for the width, and then I'll push the mirror image to move the needle in the right position. I also have a foot that I'll be using and I'll explain that as I go, but it has a little guide on the edge that will keep the fabric from moving too far to the right as I'm sewing. When sewing this design, just like any other quilt, you have to stay organized as you're moving along. And of course, you would start chain sewing your pieces if you wanted to get a factory going. Before uh, going too far, you need to uh, pass a sewing test. And first of all, the two littlest squares need to equal the next log in size. And if they don't, then you need to adjust your seam allowance so that it does. Now I'm going to pull those two pieces down and we will first connect those two. Now just imagine that if you have passed the sewing test, you would start chain sewing everything together. And you'd actually probably do all the little ones first before you moved on to the other log. Now put these two pieces right sides together. Also, I need to, to point out one other thing. You always start with the light in the corner. And we're going to put these two pieces right sides together, and I'm going to turn it over on the back side so that I don't have to worry about that seam allowance uh, flipping backwards. Now, I'm not pinning the two pieces together because it's really not necessary to do so. And as I approach that seam, I will hold the fabric down with the stiletto. Actually, it's better than pinning because pinning will uh, sometimes get in your way. Then after you have sewn that, and just imagine then that you have done probably 20 of those, then you would start to go on to the next piece. But you first take the time to finger press everything open. First on the wrong side, then move every, uh, every block to the right side and press it again. And just lightly go over the top of it. Okay, then you're ready to go to the next set of blocks. And up here we've already got one in progress. See how this one now will go down here next. The piece that you add next always goes over the last seam that you made. That's an easy way to think about it. That will help you stay organized as you're going. Again, turn it over so that you have the seam that you're going to sew over on the top. See how nice that foot is to control the fabric? Now because I don't have any pins, of course I don't have to worry about the edge of that foot hooking into the pins. Open it up and you'll see how the block is starting to come along. And again, finger press that seam open on the wrong side and then on the right side. I like to use this method of putting the log cabin together better than the one that I used the first time I made a log cabin. And that was done where you cut all these long strips and then you have what you call the sew before you cut method. You sew all the strips onto the block and then cut them off as you're going. And what happened to me when I got to the end of that block was that they were all a little bit different. And I had to trim them up at the end. And if you have passed the sewing test, you shouldn't have that problem with this particular uh, technique. 
Now the next one will go over two seams. Now let's make sure, nope, it goes over one. See, it's just one down here. Just remember that when you're building the block, you don't want to get going in the wrong direction. So every time you add the next piece, you go over just one seam. If you're going over more than that, it's on the wrong side. The reason that I sew with a scant quarter inch is because you need to make up for the amount of fabric that is used in the seam line. This is a nice pattern to work on if you're sitting in a room where there's a TV going or you've got the family around because you don't have to do a lot of thinking when you're working on it. Okay, and then press it on the right side. I like to use a small iron at the sewing machine because the big one gets a little bit clumsy to, to get at. Now up here then we'll be ready to add the next fabric down here. And remember I said that not all of the fabrics need to be so pretty in the design. Well, there's a couple here that have a lot less interest in them, but it's the ones like this that add so much life to it. Now we'll add the next one. And remember to go over just one seam. And if you're going over more, if you went over here, see I would be going over two of them. Now if you're a beginner and you happen to make a mistake, you have to learn how to reverse sew. And it becomes very frustrating for some, if you, especially if you've done a lot of sewing wrong. And there always is more than one way to rip a seam and we're, we all have been familiar with the type where you pick each of the stitches apart. Well, there's also another way, which is a little bit safer, especially if you're a beginner, and that's just lay the piece up in front of you, and I'm holding it down with my hand, and see how easy that is? It's very fast and easy to do, if you happen to get it on the wrong side. It's just another way to rip out a seam. By the way, that one was put on right, but I just wanted to show you how easy it would be to change if you did it wrong. Then we're ready to continue on going down in here. And I'm going to show you how to put one more of these on. You put it up here and like this. You could really get a factory going if you were working on the whole quilt at one time. Now I said that you can make this quilt, of course, as large as you wanted to. So if you were going to do a baby quilt, you could just determine you probably would need just nine knots all together. So it would go very fast. Then you would stop and finger press that seam open. Take the time to press it and continue on. See how easy that is to build the block? You just continue working your way out to the outside edge over here. Now I'm going to show you how to lay those blocks out and make your knot. After you're all done making equal amounts of both the light and the dark block, then make them into equal amounts of knots. Now I call this block over here one completed dark knot. And to make the whole quilt, you have to have equal amounts of these. So put these two seams first, right sides together. 
Now there will be only one place where I will pin on this block. And when I turn this over, you'll see this is all a straight piece here and there's only one area that I need to match. And then on the top side, here is where I have all the seams. Now what I'm going to do is pin a fourth of an inch from the edge right on that seam line. And I'm going to leave that pin standing and I'm going to put one more on the right and the left side of that standing pin. And the rest of it I will just finger pin as I'm going. Well, now I've created a problem for myself. I have to switch feet because I can't jump over those pins with that foot, so I'll put on the one that I call the open toe foot. And this one doesn't have a bridge in front of it, and I will be able to see exactly what I want to do. Also, I can go over pins with this particular foot. Slow down, though, when you get to them. And I'm using a silk pin with a very tiny shaft in it. Okay, we'll just finger pin this corner down here. And then I will guide these seams then with the stiletto in front of the needle. See how you can poke it way up in front there and not have to worry about your finger getting sewn? Then after you have this seam sewn, of course, like everything else, you press it open, first on the wrong side and then the right side. But let's make sure that we've got it going in the right direction. Yep, that's right. And finger press it open. Now a lot of you, when you're making the log cabin, will press your seams to one side rather than open. And that doesn't mean that you're doing it the wrong way. It just happens to be that I prefer to do it this way. I, I like the fact that I don't have all of the bulk in, in the seam line. Especially when you're hand quilting, I don't like that extra bulk there. Now the rest of the quilt would just simply be finished by then sewing these two together here and then through the middle. And I'm going to show you the back side so that you can see what a back of a block will look like. See how all of them are uh, pressed open? And earlier on, I was talking about the quilting of this design. We went all the way through here, and then we came this way over the top of that seam line. That way, it seemed like we were really tying the knot with this design. I like to use a low loft batting when I do all of my quilting because I like the way it drapes on the bed. Also, it's very easy to quilt. After you've completed the quilting, make sure you take the time to sign your quilt so that the next generation will know who made it. And what I do is I take uh, a specific pattern that I want to use to make the label, and I use a little light box so that I can see the paper or the design underneath. Now, I haven't put one here, but what you do is simply lay the design down, and then you put the fabric on top that you want to work with, and I use a Pigma pin to, to mark in all of the lines. And of course, you can put to and from in the center of the design, and you can decorate it however you want to. These are permanent, and they'll be forever.